Beyond the Mic with Sean Dillon. I'm Sean Dillon. We're joined on the star line by a woman who has written multiple books, The Madonna Code, Mysteries of the Divine Female Unveiled, and her latest book, Tao of Influence, Karen McGregor. Nice to be here, Sean. Thank you. Let's go beyond the mic. As a single mom, what was the first challenge you needed to tackle to start on your path of success? Well, I really needed to have a deep respect for systems because, you know, I had two <laughs> little kids to feed and I was really good at speaking because that was what I was doing at the time, speaking and, and hosting workshops. But the reality of it was I didn't have any systems in place. So I really had to have a balance. And that's part of what I write about in, in the Dow of Influence is a balance between you know, having those structured systems in a business, but also, you know, who are you being and that essence of who you're being. So the two together are very important. You've gone through the loss of business partners, family illness. How have you overcome such adversity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I lost my dad. And at the same time, I lost my business partners and my business then went through a divorce. So there was, there was a lot of grief there. And I would have to say that a couple of the biggest things that I can share with people if they're going through something like that is that you really have to be very focused on what is your mind producing in terms of your thoughts, you know, because our thoughts are really not us. That's where we get all entangled is every time we think a thought, we identify it with ourselves. But in reality, our mind is like a wild beast, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Isn't it, Sean, you know? Oh, I know that. <laughs> right? It goes all over the place and can get us going into lows and highs and chaos and drama. So I would say that has always been from that time. Uh, something that I've learned is really to walk, just observe the craziness of my mind and not to get caught up into an original thought that's crazy, you know, to allow that to just Slow down the river of, of thoughts because it doesn't belong to me. So I think when people practice that, that is an incredible tool. And I think the second thing is that the moment that I started having respect of learning from other people, what is it, you know, uh, to do to reach success? Because I ha- I was very smart. I you know I had my master's in education and and I thought well you know, I can figure this business thing out and and surely, you know, I must be able to just observe other people and figure it out. But I would say to anyone who's thinking of starting a business or maybe you're stuck in business, that the biggest thing you need to do is to get the right help, not any help, but, you know, the right help for that thing that you're struggling with. What was your motivation to examine Tao Te Ching and identify these factors for Tao of Influence? Thank you. Well, there was a couple of things. Uh, when my dad passed, there's a beautiful lady across the way. She's pregnant, and she, you know they were starting a family. And I didn't know her, but when my when my dad's funeral happened, she had slipped a note under my mother's door, and and I happened to be the one to receive it. And I opened the note up, and you know it talked about my dad. And she said, "I never knew your dad. We never spoke." But when he was out in the yard and and building these different, you know, pieces of patio furniture for your mom and and fixing the fence, he always had this big smile on his face. And she said, I really wish for my family that, you know, we can take care of each other that way with a smile on our face. And at that moment, I really questioned what influence was, you know, because some often in the doingness of influence, which is important, and mastery and systems are all very important. But at that moment, I began questioning, well, what is it that really creates a legacy or an impact in our world? And it it is that it's state of being. If you're happy and fulfilled and present to people and really listening to them without an agenda of your own, that's far more influential than anything that you can do. It's important to have both, but that really was my initial journey into this whole um, Dow of Influence and starting to think about it over the last number of years. I didn't start writing till three years ago, but 
you know how with books, it's a, it's, it's a process, a, a percolating process. John. It takes a while. <laughs> yes. <laughs> how does Tao of Influence balance with the current world of mass manipulations, hidden agendas? Yes. Well, it's so rampant today, isn't it? And I think that people are just getting tired of this old world of influence because it, it has been going on for a very long time. And now, uh, you know, with our millennials and uh, the generation before, um, you know, I have an, uh, an 18-year-old and a 21-year-old, and I notice that they and their, and their friends, just they're just not interested in that anymore. They want the truth. They want to have real discussions uh, that, that don't have any of that hidden agenda or manipulation. And so I see a whole new generation of people that are not putting up with it anymore. And, and I think that this is so important that, you know, when we step into our own influence, that we come from a place of complete truth and honesty about everything in our life, not just one thing. You know, secrets and forcing and pushing it really destroy people. Um, there's a wonderful... A uh, little vignette that I was told by a, a good friend of mine who was a student of Stuart Wilde, and he had taken him on a on a great retreat. And at the beginning of the retreat, uh, in in the Stuart Wilde fashion, he said, "You know, I'm only going to teach you one thing, and then the rest of the time we're going to party." <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah, right. And he said, uh, and and so my friend said, "Well, what is it? Like, what's that one thing?" And he said, don't lean forward and don't lean back in life. So in other words, don't try to chase or push or manipulate your way through life, but also don't escape life. Don't back away from life. Don't withdraw from what's going on in the world. And I thought that that was such a, a, a powerful but you know, simple and powerful way to express what we all can do a little bit more of. It is Karen McGregor. Her new book, The Tao of Influence, joins us beyond the mic. So, Karen, what is love power? Well, you know, the, the, the first thing is when I talk about love power, Sean, what I'm really saying is when we're born, you know, love power is what we have. It's our only source of power. And over time, uh, in order to get our needs met, you know, we kind of decide at some point that people don't really want us to have our needs met, or some people don't want us to have our needs met. So instead of going about it in our loving way when we're a little child, um, we start to develop patterns of power that actually get our needs met. So things like, you know, someone who's overly controlling or someone who withdraws from the world and seems to be passive-aggressive. These are all ways of getting our needs met when we first discover as a child that not everybody, you know, wants to support us, and then that we make that mean something about us. So, so love's power is really coming from, from that place. What makes journaling so important to capturing your love power? So journaling is a way to really reflect on what our choices are and behaviors are in a given day, because, you know, the, the main thing in, in life is to watch how we use our power. And we all have tremendous power at any moment in the day. And so when you journal, you really reflect on, hmm, you know, what was it here that I said or did that may have enhanced someone else's life, that may have enhanced, you know, the, the, the world or the planet or maybe one person's life? Um, and what was it that perhaps took away uh, from that or from your own internal sense of well-being. Karen, who influenced you to be such a powerful speaker? Well, you know, there's been many people, but one story that comes into mind in particular was that I used to invite people. This was part of my old business. I used to invite people to speak, and I was the event host, and I would put on a bunch of events for other speakers. I don't know if you've ever done this, Sean, but when sometimes people um, don't step into what they really want to do, so they are supporting the people who do what they really want to do. 
I know exactly what you're talking about. When I started Beyond the Mic, the whole purpose, I've had years and years and years of having incredible opportunities presented to me and to other people I know. And because of format or because they just didn't have the time, they couldn't go in to have these deep, in-depth conversations with artists, authors, and explore new and incredible people that people may not know. So one thing I've learned is not to say the word no. Mm, Wow, that's very powerful. Uh, You know, and for myself, being able to say yes to what I really wanted to do and create as an impact in the world was was really important. And so that that person um, that was speaking at my event at, at the end when he packed up his things, and he was just so powerful, and I could see that everybody was really had learned so much and gravitated towards him. And he just looked at me and took a, you know, a moment to pause and be present with me. And he said, Karen, you need to be out there speaking. And just that one sentence, you know, acknowledging and recognizing me for who I really was, um, shifted everything for me. And, and at that point, I actually did make plans to move away from being a host of speakers to actually speaking. What was going through your mind and in your gut as you were going from a host of speakers to actually being the speaker, in some cases the keynote speaker? It's got to be completely nerve-wracking to you. Well, definitely I had a lot of fear because I am an introvert, and many people think introverts don't speak. But uh, the, the reality is that most of us who are in the, in the limelight or in the public and speaking – are, are actually introverts, so it's a very interesting combination. Um, but I, I just remember feeling a lot of fear around the ability to impact people, not so much for myself, like, am I going to die out there, or, you know, <laughs> are people going to reject me, although I had those fears. But deep inside, I wanted to create real impact in the world, and I think that's part of you know, going back to the book is, I just find that when I have deep conversations with people like yourself, what drives us at the end of the day is knowing that we can make a difference in someone's life. Karen McGregor is the author of the upcoming book, Tao of Influence, available to be pre-ordered right now. If you're a single person, how do you find the one that's missing? There's so many people out there that go, I I can't find anyone. I can't find anyone. Is it a matter of where they're looking or is it a matter of what's in their heart? Mm, Very good question, Sean. I have uh, have a theory on the whole idea of of looking for the one or looking for the right person. Um, I actually believe that it, it does take away, when we have the long checklist, it takes away from our ability to be present. And one of the things that I talk about in my book, The Tao of Influence, is to, can you be present and just empty your mind and be there with that person? And so when you meet anyone, rather than, uh, you know, immediately your mind wanting to go to, does this person check off my box or a list of uh, checklist? long long checklist, usually, um, just to be present with them and ask yourself, hmm, what can I learn from this person today? Uh, you know, what, what can I give this person today? And those kinds of questions open it up to a wonderful opportunity to meet people and to have joy meeting people, Sean. You see, most people, they complain about dating and And I just think, wow, what if you came to that whole thing of dating with a sense of joy and awe and wonder? (laughs) It's probably likely that you're going to attract more of what you like rather than more of what you don't want. (laughs) Exactly. If you're in a relationship, what in your mind is the number one tip to maintaining and supporting a healthy relationship? Well, I know this is going to seem a bit odd, but I truly believe it's Uh, lessening our preferences. So over time in a relationship, um, we begin to look at what is perhaps wrong in the relationship rather than all the wonderful things that, you know, we can really cherish in in our relationship. And so the more preferences we have, for instance, 
uh, very simple. You know, someone doesn't pick up their socks or, you know, something, or doesn't, maybe doesn't listen as well as you want them to. Doesn't mean that we can't address it. It just means, are you getting emotionally caught up and stuck on something that isn't really going to um, produce, you know, a state of joy? Um, I know a lot of um, Buddhist monks, you know, one of the things that I admire about them is that they can be in any environment, any, you can put them in anything at all, and they'll always be joyful. And so I'd say for people who are in a relationship, rather than looking at what's wrong with the other person or what's wrong with the relationship, just start with noticing how many preferences you have and can you lessen those to create a more joyful life. I've seen three quotes from Tao of Influence that really caught my eye from the book. Wanted to share, get your thoughts on them. One that comes from ego is accumulation, want less. Why should a person want less? Mm-hmm. And again, I want to say that if you have a goal, you know, to, to have a new car or a new house, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that when we accumulate, it is another source of preferences that we become attached to. And most often, Sean, the, the, the things that we accumulate actually are supporting our identity of success. You know, if I have this, then I'm successful, or if I have this, then I'm happy. Um, And the reality is, as we all know, if we have a new car, it becomes old after, you know, a few months, and uh, or if we have a new bigger house, that becomes our norm. So, um, you know, acquiring things is, is never really going to add up to our ultimate uh, state of fulfillment. That goes directly to the second line. Desire comes from the soul. It is not wanting. It is a state of being aligned with your highest purpose. Desire more. Karen, how do you balance the want less but desire more? Mm, I love that question. So for me, the, the wanting that's attached to our identity of success is the thing that we ultimately want to lessen. Desire, though, for me, comes from a a deep part inside of you that actually desires to to align yourself with your with your real mission, your purpose in life. Like Sean, I I notice that you know you really light up when you talk about what it is that you do, and so noticing that in ourselves, what lights us up, what what brings the fire back to our soul, you know, and what makes us in a conversation all of a sudden light up. And those things are things that sometimes over time, if we get beaten up by life or we let, we let ourselves get beaten up by life, that light um, inside dims, that desire dims. So they're very different um, because one is, you know, coming from our ego and one is really coming from a very deep part of us that that wants to make an impact, wants to influence, wants to be aligned with, with who we really are inside. And I think that's the, one of the big things, just as a side note, is the best way we can create impact and influence is to recognize who people really are at their heart and at, their, at the essence of who they are. Because when we see them, you know, Sean, I've, I've been interviewing so many people who work for big companies, and one of the things that they say to me over and over, almost everybody says it, is that they don't feel seen for who they are. The last note from that I want to bring up from the book, and then I'm going to make people, everyone, go out to their local retailer and get Dow of Influence, is simplicity is a space you create for your soul to breathe, to be. It's the natural beingness when we are tired of wanting and exhausted by the clutter of the world. Desire, simplicity, want nothing, have everything. Yeah, that, that's such a beautiful quote. I, it's one of my favorites from the book. And uh, um, I just want to share that simplicity, again, doesn't mean that you have to deprive yourself. It just means that when you have spaciousness in your life, in other words, you don't have to think so much about 
all the different things that you own and that you, you know, that you acquire, um, you'll find that that spaciousness actually creates a, a great deal of fulfillment and stillness in your life. You know, if, if you're always thinking about taking care of the multitude of cars or, in my case, you know, shoes, <laughs> 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 it's just one more thing to add to the mind, you know, craziness. As we said, the mind is a beast and it will hang on to anything that you allow it to hang on to. So I, I always like to say that simplicity is very closely related to the stillness of the mind. If you feel that you can reach a stillness, um, that's really where we all want to be more. Um, and, and so simplicity isn't just how much you own or, or how much you don't own. It's really a way of life, isn't it, where, where, we, can, where we can just walk through life without having a lot of different details on our mind. Yes, we have to do the things we do, um, but we don't have to experience them as chaos and drama. So that's another thing that the Tao teaches us, the Tao Te Ching. Um, it's a 4,000-year-old uh, book of um, Chinese, uh, from a Chinese philosopher named Lao Tzu. And uh, the, the, the biggest teaching I got from the book was that you know, we, we all have challenges, Sean, but it's the different, what makes the difference between those people who have challenges and those people who are happy with their challenges is that they don't, the, the happy people don't experience the challenge. They don't get drawn into the chaos and the, the drama of the challenge. They just go to work on solving the challenge. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Time's running out, so it's time for the Rocky Nate. It's the first thing that comes to your mind. No pressure. Okay. Last vacation you took was where? Peru. First thing you do every morning is? I meditate. Thing that scares you the most? Heights. Place that you haven't visited but want to? Dolly. Your best friend gave you the nickname? I don't have a nickname, sorry. How many shoes do you own? 30. Last piece of advice you gave your youngest son, Mitchell? Just to take his, um, you know, problems and really watch them go down the river and just allow himself to be present to fulfillment and happiness. What's the one goal you haven't achieved but on the path to doing? New York Times bestseller for the Dow of Influence. And on that note, uh, Dow of Influence is actually available in June, uh, this coming June. So it's not quite out yet, but um, um, you can definitely pre-order on Amazon. She is the author of Dow of Influence, available soon at a retailer near you. Karen McGregor, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you again, Sean. And that, my friends, is Beyond the Mic.